Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 30, again, we're uh, wrapping up this book as we've been going through it uh, chapter by chapter over the last several months. And uh, again, as I men- I'll mention again, as I did last week, if you recall, uh, kind of these last few chapters and, and a consistent theme throughout the book of Deuteronomy is uh, these, this concept of obedience and blessing, disobedience and cursing. And, you know, it's almost at the point of redundancy. But again, I think the reason why that is, is because of the fact that these are some of the parting words of Moses. And the reason why he's just hammering this in, especially in these latter, latter chapters, is that uh, because there's a real need for us to understand and learn this concept that obedience equals blessing and that disobedience brings the curse of God upon our lives. And again, if you've been with us uh, through these last few sermons, this is something that he's really driven in and is continuing to do with the last few moments he has with the nation of Israel after he's led them out of the wilderness and spent you know, so many decades with them, wandering with them, trying to teach them and instruct them. Now he's ready to pass off the scene. And again, he's just reiterating the same theme, just hammering this, this need for them to learn to obey the voice of the Lord their God. And it says there in verse 1, And it shall come to pass, and all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and thou and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all the command thee this day. So again, uh, the reason why he's uh, emphasizing this need to obey is because you can see from Moses' words, he already knows what's going to happen. God already knows that when they get into the promised land, they're going to get you know, you know, uh, fat and sassy. They're going to get in there and they're going to start in, in, in taking over this land, dwelling in houses they didn't build, dwelling, you know, eating of olive yards and vineyards they didn't plant. And it's going to go to their heads. They're going to forget the Lord their God. And he's already reminding them of a promise that they're going to need, you know, many generations later that they, when they are in that, in fact, in that land, when God does, in fact, bring the curse upon them, that they need to turn to the Lord their God and to remember him. And call to mind uh, all these things among the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And it says in verse 2, And shalt return to the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all, na- all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Again, this isn't something I really want to spend a lot of time on in this sermon, because there's, there's other things here. But notice here that when God brings the nation of Israel into the land, when they believe on the Lord, when they turn to the Lord thy God with all their heart, that's when God has compassion upon them and gives them and, and gathers them from all nations. You know, which, which should, you know, and that concept ring, it, it, it rings through true, true through all scriptures. That should remind us of the fact that, you know, the, the false state of the nation of Israel, that is not God's chosen people over there today. Those people are not believing on the Lord, uh, the Lord God. They're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't have the Father and they don't have the Son. You know, that was not God's doing. 1948 was not a miracle. That was the working of man and, and others. But uh, again, I don't want to park it on that, that topic. That's something that's been preached, you know, quite a bit here in this church. But I think what, we can really, what I really want to drive in tonight or get us to understand is that God desires to forgive people. It's God's desire that he would be able to forgive the disobedient, that he would be able to restore those that are, are, are experiencing his wrath and his punishment, that are on the receiving end of his chastening. You know, it's not God's desire to just, uh, you know, chasten people and to punish them. I mean, but obviously that's what God does. I mean, God, you know, he gives them fair warning throughout all of these scriptures leading up to this. They can't say that they, they weren't warned. But we see here that God desires to restore uh, and have compassion and gather them, and he wants to forgive them. <clears throat> you see that especially there in verse 3 where it says, Then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee. That's God's desire. He will return and gather thee from all nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. It's not that God just wanted to scatter them among all nations and then forget about them and leave them in their sad state. But he actually wants to bring them back into the land and, and have compassion on them and restore them, that is his desire. Okay, now moving on here in verse 4, it says, If any of uh, thine be driven out un, uh, unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. 
<clears throat> the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which the Lord thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. So God's desire, again, is to restore them, to, restore the, to forgive them and restore the disobedient. And he even says he'll go so far as the outmost parts of heaven to, to, to retrieve them. He will bring them and he will go and fetch them and he will bring them into the good land that he had promised them. That's what God's desire is. And again, it's interesting that you know, God doesn't say, well, you can come into the land and then we'll talk. He says, I'll even go to the farthest uh, parts of heaven and bring you back. <clears throat> and here's what I want us to understand, because again, the nation of Israel, we can liken you know, unto uh, our own selves. You know, we can learn, we can apply this personally in our own lives. A lot of the things that happen unto them, you know, we can liken unto our own personal walk with the Lord. I mean, the, the nation of Israel is kind of a picture of the Christian life. If you think about it, you know, you're brought out of the bondage of sin in Egypt. You know, you're baptized. Uh, you, you, well, first of all, you have the, you know, the, the, the Passover and the blood is applied. You're saved and you're baptized. You know, and then there's that learning process in the wilderness. You grow as a Christian. You go into the promised land. You live a, a victorious Christian life. But it's possible that we as Christians, you know, we can end up like the nation of Israel, where even after we've, uh, you know, done all these things, we've, we've uh, you know, we've grown, we've walked with the Lord, we're saved, that we might begin to wander. You know, our hearts might grow cold, and it might be that God has to start to chasten us in our lives. And here's what I want us to understand, is that no matter how far we get away from God, it's always His desire that we would return. If we're His children, there's, there's always a way back. And, a lot of, and I think this is important because a lot of people, they get, they get a, to a point in their Christian life where they just think, well, I've committed so much sin, you know, I've done so, I made such a mess out of my life, that I might as well just, you know, I, as much as I think I'd like to go back and serve the Lord, I, I'm just sure He wants nothing to do with me now. You know, there's no point in me going back to church. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just going to keep living this sinful life. It's not, you know, it's, I know it's going to be miserable and it's, it's not really what I want. But they just have this, this uh, you know, this guilt and this, they, this misunderstanding <laughs> that, that they think that God won't forgive them, that God's not waiting for them to come back with open arms. And that therefore, they just continue to go down this path of sin and disobedience and continue to endure the chastening hand of God. But what we're seeing here in these first few verses is the fact that God's desire is to have compassion. That God's desire is to forgive. And it doesn't matter how far away from God we've gotten from them, or from Him, rather, that He wants us to come back. That God is willing to receive us unto Himself, no matter how distant we've become, whether it's you know, the outmost parts of heaven. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that, and if you would turn to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, is that God often, he goes, if you notice the, the way he speaks in those verses there, verses 4 and 5, is that he's going to find them where they are and bring them back. He, you know, he's not just waiting uh, for them to return in and, of their, in and of themselves. Of course, they have their part to do with, you know, having to, to repent and to, you know, seek the Lord and things like that. But God goes and finds them where they're at. You know, and often I think that's the way it is in a lot of Christians' lives. You know, we might find ourselves in some backslidden state and think that you know, God's just done with us. But even then, God will come and begin to work in our lives and to minister to us and to try and bring us back into the fold, to bring us back into walking, the, walking with Him and living for Him and, and to come back from that. The Bible says in Psalm 86, you're going to Psalm 103, "...for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive." Now, that's one of the great things about God is, is just His readiness to forgive. That He is plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. You know, you're not going to exhaust God's patience. You're not going to exhaust God's willingness to show mercy and compassion and to, and to forgive. It says, Thou, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. That is, you know, that is the nature of the Lord. You know, and thank God for that, because I'm sure every Christian is going to need that to some degree or another in their life. They're going to need to you know, uh, call upon those attributes of the Lord. They're going to need to know that God is long-suffering and that God is plenteous in mercy and truth. You know, we're probably all going to you know, make mistakes and, and mess up, some more than others, but we have to understand that no matter how far or how bad you know, we might make, I'm not saying we should, you know, but if we do, no matter how much of a mess we make, you know, God is willing and able to forgive, and that God wants to, that He's very long-suffering. 
It says there in Psalm 103, look at verse 6. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. <coughs> Excuse me. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10. Uh, he is high above the earth, or excuse me, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, and remembereth that we are dust." As for man, his days are as, a, are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know, shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. So again, here we see you know, God's uh, compassion is, is being expressed. We see that God's, these attributes of God's long-suffering and His mercy and His goodness, you know, He's merciful and He's gracious, He's slow to anger, He's plentiness and mercy, He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever, right? These, these attributes of God's compa compassion are being expressed. And, the, and He likens it unto a man towards His Son, right? God, you know, is, you know, we see that He tempers His chastening due to the frailty of man. You know, look there in verse, uh, verses 14. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. You know, if God were just let loose, it wouldn't take very much to, for God to just crush us, for God to just wipe us out. And, and God, you know, often I believe in our lives shows grace and mercy and, 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 he, and he holds back and he remembers that we are but dust. But what I want us to understand out of this is this is not to be taken as a license to just go sin, to just say, well, I know all these things about God. I know that God is compassionate. I know that God is long-suffering. I know that God will pity me and have mercy upon me. And after all, I'm just human. You know, I'm just a man. I'm just, you know, I'm just flesh and blood. I'm just dust. You know what? I can't help it. You know, I'm going to do these sinful things, and I know God will forgive me. You know, we've got to read the language here and, and, and pick up on the fact that, you know, we don't want to be guilty of, you know, sinning presumptuously. I'm just saying, well, I'm going to do this sin now, and then I'll ask for forgiveness later. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a bad attitude to have. But God's mercy is actually reserved for the repentant, those that are turning towards the Lord. If you would, look at verse, uh, verse 11. He says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. That's the key of ver verse right there, part of that verse. So great is his mercy towards them that fear him. You know, if we want God's mercy in our life, you know, if we find ourselves in some backslidden state, you know, we're going to have to learn to fear God. We're going to have to actually get out of that, that, that state of being backslidden and start to fear God again. You know, it's that we can't just continue going in our sin and just saying, you know, I'm just going to continue to live a backslidden life and just continually ask God to forgive me and I'm sure things will turn out fine. No, they won't. But the promise is, is that if we learn to fear Him and if we will repent, if we'll turn from those sins, if we'll get that out of our life, that mercy is there. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, what, uh, that's the, you know, the important caveat that we have to remember here. It's not just this license that, well, God's just you know, this merciful God that's going to just you know, be okay with my, my sinful life. No, God, you know, if you want that mercy and that grace, you have to learn to fear the Lord your God. It's reserved for those that are repentant. <clears throat> And he says the same thing there in uh, verses uh, you know, 11, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Verse 18. To those that remember his commandments and, and to, uh, to do them. You know, those that will actually live for the Lord. Those that want to get their life cleaned up and start living for God and get back on the right path. That option's always there. And no matter how far down the, the, the wrong way they've gone. You know, if any time, like the prodigal son, if they want to come to their senses, you know, and realize that they're eating on the husks of this world and they're going to fill their, their, their belly with the filth of this world, you know, God's, God's at home. The Father's at home. 
looking for them to return. But they're the ones that are going to have to leave the pigsty behind and come back to the Lord. <clears throat> so God's mercy is reserved for those that want to repent, the repentant. <clears throat> you know, you have to notice that in our text back there in Deuteronomy chapter 2, all these merciful attributes that, that they go through that Moses expresses there about how God's going to turn uh, their captivity and have compassion upon them and gather them from all the nations. You know, that all comes after verse 2. And it says in verse 2 of Deuteronomy 30, And thou and shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. You know, that, that's something we need to learn to apply on a personal level. And even as a nation, you know, this nation, we can, we can get up and sing God bless America all we want. But until this nation is ready to turn from its sinful ways, you know, from the sins of abortion and fornication and the drunkenness and the adulter adultery and the idolatry and the covetousness and the oppression of the poor and everything that this country is guilty of, you know, you can, you can sing God bless America to your blue in the face. You know, and it's not going to make it, and it's not going to make a difference. God wants to see people that are ready to return unto the Lord their God and do what? Obey His voice, and to remember to do His commandments, and not just pay lip service to Him. And we have to understand, well, what's the purpose of it? You know, what's the purpose of God being so willing to forgive and God so willing to 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 receive those that are willing to you know repent? What's the point of it? Is so that they can serve Him again. You know, God wants to restore Israel here. He wants to, he's giving them this promise that, look, if you get out of sorts with me, if you find yourself scattered in other nations, you know, there's a way back, and I'm going to bring you back, but it's not just so that you can be safe again. It's so that you can learn to live for me and that you can serve me and, be, and bring glory uh, to him. So that's why the Lord, you know, he's so willing to just deliver them and to show this compassion so that they might serve him once again. Look there in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. In verse 8, And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. He's not just you shall return and take it easy and just go back about your merry way. No, you're going to return, and you're going to obey my voice. You're going to do what I said, and you're going to keep my commandments. That's what God wants for them. So we have to see again this, that you see again this theme that's just been throughout all the book of Deuteronomy, and it's just something that he's just hammering at here in these latter chapters, that blessing is always contingent upon obedience. You know, if we want God's blessing in our life, it has to come through obedience. We can't just live however we want, and think that God's going to be okay with it, because he's not. And think that our life is going to be blessed if we're just going to go do those things which are not pleasing to him. <clears throat> it says there in verse 9, And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. So again, we see that's the God's desire for his people. That's what God wants for his children, to bless them so that he can rejoice over them. And, you know, that's something we should want for ourselves. I mean, what, that's something that we should desire in our lives, is that God would rejoice over us. And it says in verse 10 again, here's the caveat, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of this law, or excuse me, written in this book of the law, that's the, that's, the, 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 that, you know, that's the prerequisite, the willingness to obey, the willingness to keep these commandments, to keep these statutes which are written. Then the blessing comes. Then God will rejoice over us when we do those things which are pleasing to him. And really the best time to remember all this is when things are going well. The best time to, to, have all the, you know, to understand this is not when you find yourself scattered among the heathen. This is you know, when you're being chastened of God. That's, that's not, I mean, it's great if, you know, of course, those things to come back to mind and get your, your life right. But ideally, you would remember all this before that even happens. And if you remember, look at there in verse 1. And he says, and it shall come to pass and all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse. We want to remember all this when we're being blessed. 
that say, man, things are going well. God's rejoicing over this. We're being fruitful in our, in our land, in, in, our, in, our, in our cattle. You know, we're, everything's going really well. Let's not lose this. And let's remember, you know, uh, the fountain from which all blessings flow, which is, you know, every good and perfect gift uh, come, uh, descended from above, from the Father of lights. And we should remember that while things are good. And that's the danger of prosperity often, isn't it? And I think that's the danger that we, you know, for sure that we saw Israel fall into. And we can even see that in our own country. That when things, when a nation is blessed and, and they have abundance of, uh, of things, they tend to forget the Lord their God. <clears throat> so, again, we should remember this when all these things come upon us and when the blessing is upon us. But, you know, if, and often that's not the case. And we have to go through that chastening, you know, to some degree or another, whether as an individual or a nation, no matter how, but we have to remember that no matter how far from God we are, he will forgive us, that there's always a way back. You know, if, if you're still here sucking air, you know, God still has a plan for you. I don't care if you're face down, you know, you're God's child, you're saved, you're, you're out just living a wicked life. If God hasn't, you know, taken you home, there's still work for you to do, and you could still turn your life around and do it. God is still willing to forgive us no matter how far from him we get as his children. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, this is a faithful saying. And if you would turn over to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering." for a pattern to them which should believe, hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul's saying, look, I'm a pattern to other people. And if you're at the call, you know, when Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners, you know, obviously that might be a bit of an exaggeration. Who can really know that? But no doubt, when, before Paul got saved, he was a very wicked man. I mean, he was doing some terrible things. But God saved him and showed him mercy. Why? As a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. As an example to the rest of us, you know, that God is willing to save the sinner, that God is willing to forgive, you know, those that are, uh, you know, repentant for what they've done. <clears throat> so, again, no matter how far we are from God, he will forgive us. But that's not to say that, you know, we won't suffer the consequences of sin. You know, we can't go out and just sow all these wild oats and then, and then just pray that God, you know, that the, the harvest isn't going to come, come due. We're still going to have to reap that harvest. And, uh, you know, there's still going to be consequences. It's just that now we can go about sowing good seed and wait for that harvest to come in. <laughs> so we will still suffer since consequences. We should never take this as, well, I can just go out and live however I want and just be a wicked individual. And then when I, you know, have had my fill of the, of the pleasures of sin for, this se for a season, then I'll get right with God and live for him as I, when I get older and everything will be fine. No, there will be things that will follow you the rest of your life. There's mistakes that you can make. There's sins that you can commit. The consequences of which you're going to have to live with. Yeah, the sin's forgiven. It's forgotten. But the consequences that come with it, they don't go away. Often they can stay with you your entire life. <clears throat> so it would be better to remember God's goodness, you know, and when the blessings are here, it would be better to remember that and experience his blessings than to find ourselves in need of his mercy. I mean, wouldn't it be better to just find out, to say, well, I understand, I can read the Bible here. We could even look to the example of other people that we might know and say, well, look at the mistakes they made. I don't need to go and do that. I, I could see how that turns out. And then we can look at other individuals, you know, who are living a very blessed life. We can read about all the good things that God wants to do for us. <clears throat> and we can make that decision without having to go and experience it for ourselves. We can say, well, let me just live a life that God can bless you know, I'm glad that God's merciful and long-suffering and, and willing to, you know, receive me if I go astray. But that's not, just because that's an option doesn't mean you have to go take advantage of it. You know, that, and in fact, again, because even though that option's there, there's going to be a lot of other baggage that comes along with that. He says in Romans chapter 2, where you are, verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them that which doeth such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that what? The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know, it would be better just read about how merciful and longsuffering and compassionate God is and understand that that's him and how good he is that he's, 
you know, willing to just reach the, you know, the, 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 you know, the utmost parts of heaven to bring back those that are, are turned unto him once again, to just understand that and know that and say, wow, God's good, and then just go ahead and live an obedient life in the light of that fact, in the light of the scriptures. Does that make sense? Rather than saying, well, let me see if that's true. Let me go see how far away from God I can get, and then, and then I'll go experience his goodness in that way. Then I'll go experience the mercy and compassion and all that. No, you can just read about it and say, wow, God is good. Let me just go ahead and be obedient now. Let me just go ahead and praise him for that now. Because here's the thing, you know, Israel, they're being warned here in the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, just over and over and over and over again. Moses is saying, obey, 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 blessings, cursings, blessings, cursings, just ad nauseum. And we're reading it, you know, and we're hearing the preaching of it. And we read it for ourselves, so we, like they, you know, we've kind of been warned. We've been warned, and we, like they, have no excuse. And, and he says here, if you would go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, pick it up in verse 11. He said, for this is the commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. He's saying, look, you know, you know who I am. God's saying, look, I'm warning you right now. This is how I am. Yes, I'll, you know, I, I'm very merciful and long-suffering and compassionate. And you can find about, you can, you can learn that about me through the blessings that I'll bring upon the obedient, or you can learn about it when you get tired of your sin and, and decide to come back. And then you can see how merciful I am. But in the meantime, you know, however, in the meantime, you will suffer the chastening hand of God. <clears throat> so he's saying, look, it's not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should, shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. God's saying, look, I'm not hiding in the shadows. I'm not, my, my, my will for you is not this mysterious thing. I've made it very plain what I expect for my people and the consequences that come with obedience and disobedience. He's, made it, he's laid it all out there. <clears throat> and it's interesting there, it wasn't, it wasn't just near them, it wasn't just nigh them, but it was actually in their mouth, the Bible says, and in their heart. You know, they read it, they, they, they heard it, and they understood it. And we're in, the same, we're in that same boat today. You know, this made them accountable. We've heard these things. You know, we've read these things. We understand just as much as they do who God is and what is expected of his people. <clears throat> and, you know, that's why God gives us his word. You know, that's why God hasn't hidden the Bible up in heaven. He hasn't hidden it, you know, in some cave somewhere across some ocean. We're not going to have to, you know, charter somebody to go over and find it for us and bring it back and remind us of what it says. I mean, we're surrounded by the word of God. We have it in abundance. <clears throat> why, did God, why does God give us his word? Why does God has just preserved this book for us to read ourselves and to know? so that we can do it. Not because God knows we've got time to kill and it could use some good reading. God has given us a great, you know, wonderful book to read. And yeah, we love the, the, the poetry and the literature of it, and that aspect of it, but God has given it to us so that we can actually do it. That we can actually do these commandments that are written in here. That's why he's given it to us. It says in Psalm 19, I'll read to you, the statue of the Lord, uh, statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned. Look, these, the word of God is a great thing. It's wonderful. I mean, look at the way he's describing it. You know, he's saying the fear of the Lord is clean. He says the commandments of the Lord are pure. They're enlightening the eye. They're more desired than, be, than gold, than much fine gold. They're sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. And, but, you know, the real, the real reward, the real value in the word of God, moreover by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, is, there is great reward. So the reward comes not just from reading the word of God, not just from having a copy of the Bible on the shelf at home, but actually picking it up and reading it. Because when we read it, we're warned. And that's the reward of the Word of God. <clears throat> so, really, you know, the summation here that, uh, of Moses' instructions is that 
the Word of God can be a blessing or it can be a curse. You know, it cuts both ways with the Bible. That's kind of what he's wrapping everything up in, after everything he said in the book of Deuteronomy. His kind of his last point, because often, you know, you got to think about the fact that people tend to remember the kind of the last thing they hear. You know, that's something we try to emphasize as preachers or practice as preachers, is that, you know, people are probably only going to get one thing out of a sermon. So you might as well just try to make that sermon about one thing and, and, and close it with a strong statement. Because people, you know, just human nature, we tend to kind of remember the last thing that we heard. Maybe one thing stands out with us. So the parting words of Moses, or what it is he's trying to get across, is pretty important. And that's really what he's getting, trying to get across here, is that the Word of God can be a blessing to you, or the Word of God can be a curse to you. It's a blessing, it's a reward if you keep it, and it's going to be a curse if you don't. And like I said last week, it's not like there's a third option. It's not like there's this gray area or this middle road where, you know, it's going to be neither. It's going to be one or the other in our lives. And we're, you know, we're in that same predicament as Israel. <laughs> if you would, go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, it says this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. You know, you know taking heed to the word of God would do us well. You know, it's going to fix a lot of problems in our life. It's going to keep a lot of problems out of our life. It's going to teach us how to live a life that's going to be blessed of God. He says, you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. I always love that illustration that he uses there. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. That's what he's saying this sure word of prophecy is. He's likening it unto a light in a dark place. You know, I wonder if we really treat it like that. You know, I think it's a great illustration. You know, we, if, imagine walking in, when you go home tonight, you know, the sun's gone down since you left and came to church. You're going to go back if, you, if the lights aren't on. And the first thing you're going to do when you walk in the door is turn on the lights. I mean, who's going to go home tonight and stumble around in the dark for 15 or 20 minutes before they decide, well, I guess I'll make my way to the light switch and turn that on. I've stubbed my toe enough. I've knocked over enough, you know, planters or whatever. I think it's time to turn the lights on. No, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go work, you know, you're going to hit that light switch because you want to see the obstacles. You want to see so you can, you know, not stub your toe and so on and so forth. But is that how we treat the Bible? Is that how we treat the sure word of prophecy? You know, or are we stumbling around in the dark in life? You know, well, I'll get to it eventually. I'll find out what it says about that later. You know, I'll read that later. I'll, I'll, deal with, I'll turn this switch on later. Let me just stumble around in life for a little while. Let me just, you know, fumble around in the darkness, get hurt, fall over. Let me fall down a flight of stairs, you know, hurt myself, get a rug burn. And then, then maybe I'll go ahead and turn the light switch on so I can see what I'm doing. And we, we'd say that's foolishness about the person who would go and do such a thing in their house. But spiritually, that's how a lot of us live our life. We say, well, I'll turn that on later. I'll look at that later. I'll listen to the preacher, what he has to say later. You know, well, later, you know, you might be <laughs> in a spiritual neck brace. You know, you might not even be able to make your way over to the light switch anymore. <clears throat> but I love that illustration. You know, I remember I used to, whenever I, I would bring this up from time to time with, uh, you know, bus kids when I was running a, a, a bus route, trying to, you know, teach them to read the Bible. I say, you know, if I took you kids out in the middle of the woods on a dark night, you know, with no moon and a cloudy night, just complete, I mean, I don't know who's, who's ever been, probably everybody at some point or another has been, you know, way out in the woods somewhere, way away from the city. I mean, there's dark and then there's dark. You know, like, so where it's just so dark, you can't, you can, literally can't see your hand in front of your place, in your face. You know, if I took you all to a place like that, and said, here, you all have one, th you know, I'm not going to drop you off, you know, I'm not going to tell you where you're at, you have no clue where you are, you just know it's dark, and it's going to be dark for a long time, and you all have one flashlight to get home. I mean, that flashlight would suddenly become very important, wouldn't it? I mean, you, I, if I say, hey, you can have a flashlight, you know, or a, your favorite candy bar, you know, if you were in that predicament, you'd pass up anything for that flashlight. I want to see where I'm going, I've got to find my way back. <clears throat> you know, what if I threw that light? You'd be stumbling around the dark trying to find it. 
But that's, and that's why I love this illustration that, hey, this, this sure word of prophecy is a light that shines in a dark place. And spiritually, that's what this world is. It's a dark place where we can just fumble around, run into things, get hurt spiritually, but we have this light. But the question is, are we turning it on? Are we going to the switch? Are we, are we moving that, you know, the switch forward and looking at where we're going? You know, he says that his light is a, is a lamp unto my feet. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a lamp, uh, light unto my path. The Bible is a, a spiritual light that we need to make sure that we have on in our life. <clears throat> he says, it's a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. So go ahead and turn back to... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. So look, you know, there's a lot of, we can, we can be warned by the things of God through the Bible. We can be warned, warned about the things of God. You know, we can avoid the, 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 the curse of God in our life, the chastening hand of God in our life, if we'll read the book and we'll do the things that are written in here, if we'll keep them. <clears throat> but, if, you know, in it, but if we don't, you know, we're going we're gonna to suffer the consequences. And that's what, that's what Moses is driving in here. Look, you have two options in life. You can be blessed or you can be cursed. You can have God's blessing in your life or you can have God's chastening in your life. It's up to you. You decide what you want. But those are the two options. You know, that's it. There's no third option here where you can say, I choose neither. It's one or the other. That's what he says in verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And what is it that he's setting before them? the commandments of God. That's what this is. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's life and good. It's also death and evil because it's warning us. It's making us accountable. And he says on verse 16, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day, ye shall surely perish. Look, just as much as the promise of God's blessing is, is there. You know, he's saying, look, God, God will, for sure God is going to, if you love him and walk in his ways and keep his commandments and statutes, thou mayest live, you will multiply. And the Lord shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. He says that's a promise out of the word of God. It's the blessings there. You can have it. He said, but if you go the other way, you know, just as much as that is true, just as much as the blessing is, is 100% guaranteed, so is the curse. He says, I, you know, ye shall surely perish if your hearts wander out of the way. And he says, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record, against, uh, record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of, day, of thy days, that thou mayest dwellest in the land of Egypt, which the land which the Lord thy God swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So again, he's saying, look, you have two options here. And this is really what this whole chapter is about and, and, you know, a lot of the book of Deuteronomy is that you have two things to choose. You can have the blessings or you can have the curse. And, and if you're, the blessing comes through obedience. And if you would, just go to one last place. You're going to go over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. You say, well, I want God's blessing. You know, I want to, to, to God to bless me and, and to cause his face to shine upon me. And to, and to have the goodness of God and to have his blessing upon my life. That's what I want. I don't want to have to go and, and, and suffer God's you know, uh, anger and, and his cursing and his chastisement. I don't want that in my life. You know, I want to obey. <clears throat> and here's the thing. You know, I think a lot of people sometimes they want that. They understand it, but they just they don't seem to want to obey. They, do, they just can't bring themselves to do it. They just want to keep going back to their sin, back to their old ways. And you have to you scratch your head and you go, why is that? Why? I mean, people understand this. They know this isn't a mystery. They've heard the preaching. They've read it themselves. They know this is the way it is with God. I mean, didn't Israel know? I mean, they, had, they knew for sure, especially this generation. 
I mean, they saw their parents, what happened to, when they were faithless, when they, had, when they disobeyed. They saw. I mean, they understood this is how God is. But still, people, they, they get it, but still, it just seems like, why is it they still disobey? Why do they still choose sin? Why do they still choose to, to go down the wrong path and suffer the consequences, full knowing what, you know, uh, what, ends at the uh, what lay at the end of that path? Why do they do that? It's because I believe that true obedience, it begins with love. You know, you're, you're going to obey God when you love God. And I think that's really at the heart of it all. I mean, God wants us to obey, but he wants to do it from a place, because we want to, out of a place of love. <clears throat> I mean, if you really love somebody, you're going to want to please them. You're going to want to do those things that, that, that are going to bring their blessing upon you, right? And that's why, if you recall, the greatest commandment is to what? To love the Lord thy God. And that's what Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 22. Look at verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know, there's a reason why that's the first commandment. That's the great commandment. That's the greatest commandment in the Bible is to love the Lord thy God. Because if you don't get that down, you're probably not going to get the rest of them. You're probably not going to obey the rest because it's not going to come from a place of love. You know, and we can keep it up for a little while, maybe. You know, just, well, I, get, you know, I know that's what God says, so I'm just going to do it and just drag yourself through life being obedient. That's not going to last. Because it's not coming from, if we love it, we're going we're gonna to say, I love serving the Lord. I love obeying God. I love his commandments. They're a delight unto me. I love God. I love the blessings that obedience brings to my life. And who wouldn't love that? The problem is we, we lose focus. You know, we, 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 we get short-sighted spiritually. And we just choose the easy. Because serving God and living for God and being obedient isn't always the easiest thing to do. And we give into the flesh and so on and so forth, so forth. So really, our struggle to obey, when you boil it all down, stems from a lack of love, often. You know, so, the mo so well, how do we fix that? How do we fix that lack of love? Maybe we've grown cold. I mean, it says in the, latter, you know, the Bible says in the latter days, the love of many, uh, the, the iniquity shall abound. Why? Because the love of many shall grow cold. You know, the disobedience, the iniquity, the sinfulness gets worse. What? When there's a lack of love, when that grows cold. So how do we fix that? If that's, enough, if that's us, if that's going on in our heart, in our life, saying, you know, my, my love, I am being a little disobedient. You know, I'm not keeping the things uh, that I, the way I should. I'm not walking after the Lord the way I know I should. You know, I, I do feel like I, I don't love the Lord the way I should. How do you fix that? Well, I think really the best thing to do is just to stop and meditate on how much God loves you. You know, that might fix that. We realize that this love, this relationship with God is not one-way street. It's like, we love God and that's it. You know, you, you, I don't care how much you love God. You'll never love him as much as God loves you. And so that might be one way to kind of fix that. If that's a struggle that we're going through is, is to stop and think about the great love wherewith he loved us. So when we, when we meditate upon that, you know, that might rekindle the love in our own hearts and help us to live a life of obedience and therefore experience the blessing of God and not his curse. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for the promises of the word of God, Lord, that we can be blessed. And Lord, thank you for the warnings in the word of God that there is a curse that awaits the disobedient. Lord, help us to be people that will obey you and, and know your blessing. And Lord, if our hearts have grown cold, Lord, I pray that you would help us to uh, remember how much you love us, Lord, that we might learn uh, to love you in return and to obey you so that you can rejoice over us. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you. Keep us safe as we go. And we just, again, thank you for this time together in Christ's name. Amen.